Hello, it's Scott Manley here. SpaceX's most recent Starlink launch has not gone according to plan. According to a news release yesterday, they are going to likely lose 40 out of 49 satellites they launched. That's over 80% of the satellites are going to deorbit in the coming days if they haven't already deorbited. And this is because of an unfortunate uh, solar event which they didn't really anticipate the effects of. So, yes, yeah, Starlink Group 47 launched on February 3rd. It performed the it went on the southerly route where they have to perform this dogleg maneuver after they get around the Bahamas, after the second stage is deployed. The first stage lands on a barge and it has had its own problems with the recovery, but it looks like it's coming back to port safely. So they go up into orbit, they initially put it into a kind of low orbit, something like 330 by 220 kilometers, and then they deploy the satellites and they do this in a somewhat, um, well, haphazard fashion. They do this because they're trying to minimize the amount of hardware needed and this means the satellites sort of get spread out into orbit very slowly and allowed to separate before they start lighting up their you know, ion thrusters to raise their orbit into their target orbits. And what happened was when they reached orbit they were in the middle of a solar storm. Now solar storms have happen all the time. And they're usually a problem for satellites that are in much higher orbits, not Starlink, which is down deep inside the magnetosphere. But outside the magnetosphere, there's a lot of charged particles that come off the sun at very high energies, and those can hit sensitive electronics inside satellites. They can call, cause single bit errors, they can cause you know, data to be corrupted, processors to reset, and computers on hardware, which is outside of the magnetosphere, tends to be more hardened than that is deeper inside the magnetosphere. I mean, if you look on the International Space Station, they use consumer-grade devices essentially unchanged. You know, we see them using iPads, and we've seen Yusuke Maezawa using his iPhone and Inspiration4 also. And even Apple Watches, which have absolutely tiny processors in them, those work just fine because they are deep inside the magnetosphere and protected from these solar proton events. That wasn't the problem. The problem is when you have a solar flare, it is a very energetic event and it releases a lot of energy, not just in radiation, but in straight up black body thermal spectrum. A lot of extra ultraviolet radiation and that increases the luminosity of the sun by a few percent. And that extra bright, that extra heat and radiation can heat the upper atmosphere and cause it to expand outwards. So the upper atmosphere is called the thermosphere. This is above the Kármán line up to about five, six hundred kilometers. This is the region of the atmosphere where it's mainly made of disassociated atoms, right? Oxygen and nitrogen are the main constituents, but they're monatomic. So because they're monatomic and they don't hit each other very often, they're not very good at emitting any energy that they get, but when they get energy from you know, being dissociated, they tend to, you know, that tends to stick around. So the thermosphere is known because it's much hotter than the layers below it, the mesosphere. Uh, and this also means that when there's rapid changes in the brightness of the sun, the density of this atmosphere can change. So it can expand outwards when it gets a little bit more energy and then shrink inwards. And this can happen on the time scale of hours. So when SpaceX launched, they discovered that their satellites were going through denser atmosphere, but 50% denser than any previous Starlink op uh, launch has ever observed. And I guess it was decided that they would put the satellites into their safe mode while they were waiting for the atmospheric density to subside. And so they basically turned the flat satellites side on and, you know, let them cruise through the atmosphere, minimizing the amount of drag while they waited for things to change. However, when they tried to move them out of this mode, uh, they apparently had some issues. So I think what happens is they need to be able to turn, they needed to be able to turn into an orientation. Uh, and they do this using magnetorkers and reaction wheels. And these aren't particularly powerful, but they're fine for, you know, things in the vacuum of space, except in the lower atmosphere, there's just enough drag that they, that was able to overcome the reaction wheels and magnetorkers that Starlink had. So they couldn't turn into an orientation to deploy their solar panels properly and start raising their orbit. And that meant that without being able to raise their orbit, they've descended and 
they're not going to be able to get out of this. Un- <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, um, about 40 of uh, 49 is be- are believed to be the numbers that we've, we've seen, that they won't be able to make it to to space or <laughs> won't be able to make it into the higher orbits where they can actually become operational. So SpaceX put out a press release about this and they've basically said, well, this proves that SpaceX are being good patrons, good custodians of low Earth orbit. Our spacecraft, if they go up and they find that there is technical problems right away, then they deorbit very, very quickly. And this is certainly true of this group, although that's not what SpaceX wanted to demonstrate. They wanted to have their satellites go into orbit and actually operate. Uh, it is interesting that this is one of the lower insertions that we've seen in recent years. And you know, if you look over time, Jonathan McDowell, of course, the custodian of, of all, you know, basically space police. He's the space orbital police, right? He has all the best graphs. And you can see from his graph the deployment altitudes and variations in atmospheric density, which are derived based on solar luminosity data from for the last few years. So, um, yeah, it, it could be that in future launches, they have to choose to launch them into slightly higher orbits to avoid these high drag scenarios during this. Because... While this launch experienced conditions which were 50% higher than any previous Starlink launch, we are still a long way from what we might consider you know, solar maximum. We're going to see changes in the sun over the coming years, which is going to lead to a more dense upper atmosphere. This is actually similar to something that happened to Skylab. Of course, Skylab was launched and was left in orbit under the assumption that the space shuttle would come online and be able to boost it to a higher orbit. However, a higher or more energetic than anticipated solar maximum led to the atmosphere of the Earth ballooning outwards and causing increased drag, causing the Skylab to eventually sink down and deorbit before the space station could get ready. Now, of course, part of the blame, that, that's trying to blame the sun, but the truth is NASA just took a really long time to get the space shuttle going. So they're going to have to accommodate higher and higher atmospheric densities over the coming years. Therefore, they will probably raise their insertion uh, orbits a bit to account for this. I'm not sure how much leeway they have, how much margin they have with the current trajectory. They had to lose a bunch of satellites to be able to take this southern route to avoid the rough seas in the North Atlantic. But... If it's possible, they might have to lose a couple more satellites to be able to raise the orbit high enough that they don't have to worry about this in future launches. Uh, it, obviously, that's going to be something to see. So yeah, this is an interesting other factor of this, that the the outer atmosphere... So the outer atmosphere is largely entirely driven by solar activity. It is almost completely decoupled from the lower atmosphere. Like, local weather doesn't tend to affect. I guess the eruption in Tonga may actually have interfered with the upper atmosphere. It would be interesting to see if that's affected. I very much doubt it. But the, the these are largely decoupled, except that long-term climate change is actually apparently making the mesosphere shrink down a little. So the mesosphere and the thermosphere sit on top of the lower stratosphere. And when you get increased amounts of thermal absorption, infrared absorption, that means that more heat remains in the lower atmosphere, so the higher layers of the atmosphere get colder and tend to shrink down. So it's expected that over time, as uh, you know, the Earth's atmosphere warms, that we're actually going to see a less and less dense thermosphere and mesosphere, and therefore satellites will actually take longer to deorbit. So yeah, this particular event completely unrelated to any claims of climate change, right? Let's just be clear on that. This is just uh, the solar atmosphere, the sun being wild, throwing a party, sending a whole bunch of high energy photons our way, heating things up, and then SpaceX finding itself with a bunch of satellites that just simply can't get out. It's, it's not even that they didn't have the thrust on those low thrust engines, it's that they couldn't even rotate out of their safe configuration to their orbit raising configuration. SpaceX, they use Krypton thrusters rather than Xenon thrusters. That's a design decision where they use much cheaper propellant in exchange, and the price they pay is they have lower thrust, and that's fine later on, but it could actually have, it might have made the difference in this case, right? It might be that 
If they could get out of this orientation, they would be able to raise their orbits if they had higher thrust engines. I'm not sure about that. The, this is a really complex problem for someone that is on the outside to actually understand because we don't know the exact details of the satellites, the cross sections, or indeed the atmospheric density. That's something which is very hard to track and model in real time. So yeah, that's the story. Obviously, the big story tomorrow is uh, SpaceX uh, giving their Starship presentation. They could well be stacking the vehicle with the chopsticks today. Uh, I will be certainly looking for that. <laughs> but yeah, we'll see you tomorrow. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.